to circle the world, to go all the way around it. It's been the ultimate journey on this earth of ours ever since man discovered the world is round. A ship named Victoria, the lone survivor of Magellan's fleet, did it first in 1522, sailing around in just under three years. This is the first airplane to do it, one of two army biplanes that made the trip in 1924. It took them almost six months. The first solo flight to circle the globe was made by Wiley Post in this Lockheed Vega named the Winnie May. The year was 1933. In 1947, the first regularly scheduled round the world passenger service was inaugurated. The plane, a Lockheed Constellation. The airline, Pan Am. The jet age, the world shrinks dramatically. In May 1976, a new Pan Am 747 SP, the Clipper Liberty Bell, with 98 passengers aboard, shatters all previous records by flying around the world in just 46 hours. The Liberty Bell flight, like almost all those that preceded it, followed a route that roughly paralleled the equator. Only a very few planes had ever tried to go around the other way, following a north-south route over the poles and never had a plane carrying passengers attempted it. Until the weekend of October 28, 1977, Pan Am decides to celebrate its 50th anniversary by taking 172 passengers on a spectacular one-time-only flight from San Francisco over the North Pole to London, from there to Cape Town, South Africa, then over the South Pole to Auckland, New Zealand, and on back to San Francisco around the world over both the poles, all between Friday afternoon and Sunday evening. This will be a weekend to remember. It's the afternoon of October 28, 1977. Here at San Francisco's International Airport, a festive send-off party is in progress for the passengers of a flight that is about to make aviation history, Pan Am's fabulous Flight 50. In just a few minutes, they'll be boarding the flight and off on a 26,000-mile journey over a route that no airline passengers have ever flown before. Two special guests will be aboard, that's Janelle Comision, the reigning Miss Universe in the foreground, and next to her, Kimberly Toombs, Miss USA for 1977. They will be joined by other National Beauty Contest winners along the way. Today is Pan Am's 50th birthday, and the party wouldn't be complete without a cake. And I'm pleased to be here with you, and thank you for... Mr. F.C. Weiser, president of Pan American World Airways, is on hand to wish them a good trip. That's Captain Walter Mulligan, Pan Am's chief pilot, who will be in command of the flight. Of course, I'm completely honored to fly this flight today. I have a very dedicated crew, and I assure you that every one of them have been charged with the responsibility of making sure that you have the most pleasant two days in aviation you've ever had. We're all going to do that. Thank you so much for coming along. Thank you. The people who bought tickets for Flight 50 are from all over the United States. Their ages range from 11 years old to 82. They represent a wide variety of occupations and backgrounds and interests. But they have in common a love of flying and a spirit of adventure. The plane, named Clipper New Horizons, is a Boeing 747 SP. 47 feet shorter than the standard 747, it was specially designed for ultra-long-range flights. Clipper New Horizons is identical to the aircraft now used on Pan Am's non-stop New York-Tokyo, San Francisco-Auckland, and other long routes. Powered by four Pratt & Whitney jet engines, each one capable of delivering over 46,000 pounds of thrust, the 747 SP can fly higher, faster, and farther than any subsonic commercial aircraft ever built. 
On this date, exactly 50 years ago, a tiny Fokker F7 trimotor airplane loaded with sacks of mail took off from Key West, Florida and flew to Havana, Cuba, 90 miles away. It was Pan Am's very first flight and the first scheduled international flight by an American airline. Today's takeoff of Clipper New Horizons symbolizes the tremendous advances made since then by international aviation, which now serves millions and millions of people all over the world, taking them to places that just a few years ago they would not have even dreamed of going, like to the North and South Poles. Inside the cabin of Clipper New Horizons, the passengers settle themselves for the long trip ahead. They're lucky to be aboard, and they know it. Hundreds of other people wanted to buy tickets, but had to be turned down. The popularity of Flight 50 came as no surprise to Pan Am's director of advertising, Clark Holt. Uh, we were basically interested in doing something that would make the 50th anniversary be the, the big event. And that's exactly the reason for this flight. And because of the success of uh, the Liberty Bell a year ago, we knew that we had something that would be a winner. So starting actually in July was the first time that we really got really active in terms of promoting it. And a public relations release was, was written, was picked up by the various media. And lo and behold, three days later, the flight was sold out. The first leg of the flight will take them on a north-northeast course over Oregon, Washington, and Western Canada, across the Arctic Circle, and over the North Pole. Then they'll head south, fly east of Greenland and Iceland, over the coast of Norway, and on to England. The flight is over the Canadian province of British Columbia when dinner is served. Then, as darkness closes in, the passengers are treated to a Gucci fashion show, featuring the latest creations of that famed Italian designer. Collection, a sumptuous mix of texture and tone. The total look is soft, easy, unconstructed. A dramatic example of this look is shown here by Miss USA, a stunning combination of shimmering silk and soft suede. The ready-to-travel look, cool forest green, highlighted with accents of gold, modeled by Miss Universe. Gucci designs for the man's world, too. The model is the Pan Am flight supervisor. Here is one of two Pan Am flight attendants who volunteered their time to show this beautiful collection. Miss Universe again, understated elegance and fur. This is truly high fashion, 41,000 feet high to be precise. After the fashion show, as Clipper New Horizons nears the North Pole, the flight attendants break out the champagne and the captain Three, starts the two, countdown. One. Ladies and gentlemen, how about if we toast to our happy In 1909, when Robert E. Perry became the first person to reach the North Pole, it took him nine grueling months to make the journey. Flight 50 is over the pole just six hours and six minutes after leaving San Francisco, and the experience is far from grueling. When the party's over, there's just time for a short nap before landing in London. It's early in the morning, and the British capital is already bustling with Saturday shoppers. A few miles away, at Heathrow Airport, Clipper New Horizons has landed, and passengers deplane for the first of the special ceremonies that will take place at each of the stops. Official greetings are extended by the worshipful mayor of Killington. The jubilee, the 50 years, the golden jubilee of Pan Am. You rightly claim that this is a unique flight and it must be a great experience for all the passengers on your aircraft. We in Hillingdon wish a very happy flight, safe landing at Cape Town, safe landing at Auckland. That's Sarah Long, the new Miss England, who will join the flight here. Those lads in the button-covered suits are the famous Pearlies. Miss USA is fascinated. The men back home don't sport elegant silver shoes like these. This being Britain, tea is served, of course. Several representatives of the aviation press are covering Flight 50 as passengers. Among them, 
the publisher editor of Aviation Week, Bob Holtz. And this is certainly one of the uh, milestones in aviation history. Uh, going around both poles and setting a new world record in what is a standard normal passenger carrying aircraft. Uh, the last record around the pole, which was set about uh, seven or eight years ago, was a very specially rigged uh, airplane with uh, extra fuel tanks and all sorts of special gear. And I think the real significant uh, fact of this flight is that anybody can buy a ticket on it and uh, share in what is a tremendous uh, record-breaking uh, experience in aviation with an absolutely standard airplane. From London, Flight 50 heads almost due south, over France and the Mediterranean, across Algeria and the Sahara Desert, and then down the entire length of the African continent to the southern tip and Cape Town, South Africa. The flight will take 11 hours and six minutes, one of seven speed records set by Flight 50. For the passengers aboard Clipper New Horizons, the time goes fast because there's always something to do, like games to play, supplied to Flight 50 by Parker Brothers. There are postcards to write and books to read, new friends to talk to, and sights to see. It's a great, big, wonderful world down there. An artist does instant caricatures, and the beauty queens, on the other side of the camera for a change, take Polaroid pictures of just about everybody on the flight. They even shoot our cameraman. Guitarist John Garson is along to provide accompaniment for the singers aboard. A popular attraction for the women is hairdresser Edward Fleming from Elizabeth Arden. After all, if you're going to dine in style tonight, you have to look your best. And this is truly dining in style. You're watching the evening meal being served in the upstairs lounge, which Pan Am can convert to a comfortable dining room on all of its regular 747 and 747 SP flights. There are movies, of course. In all, 12 films are shown on the flight, including such classics as Casablanca and Road to Morocco. So the hours race by, and almost before they know it, the passengers are being greeted at Cape Town, South Africa. Arrival time is shortly after 11 p.m., and in spite of the late hour, a big, friendly crowd shows up to welcome the world travelers. Another beauty queen, Glynis Fester, Miss South Africa, joins the glamour contingent. So I hope that even though you can't stay to be with us and sample... The, the mayor of Cape Town speaks briefly. ...that you'll be back with us soon again, take time out. It'll be a pleasure to welcome you again and to entertain you. And as at all the stops, greetings and a gift from the mayor of San Francisco are presented. This time, Miss Universe does the honors. These written greetings personally from the mayor of San Francisco. Thank you very much. A little before 1 a.m., Flight 50 takes off into the African night. This will be the longest and in many ways the most interesting leg of the trip. 7,550 miles across the South Atlantic and the frozen expanses of Antarctica, over the South Pole, then across the South Pacific to Auckland, New Zealand. It's the first time any plane has flown this route. A few hours after leaving Cape Town, Clipper New Horizons flies into daylight, cruising at an average speed of 532 miles an hour at an altitude of 43,000 feet it will cover the distance in just over 11 hours. This is the kind of long-range flying the 747 SP was designed to do, and on Flight 50, the aircraft and engines perform flawlessly. The clouds break up, just in time to give passengers a good view of snow-covered Antarctica. You're looking at the very bottom of the world. Its stark, almost mysterious beauty is an unforgettable sight.
the first person to cross Antarctica to the South Pole was Roald Amundsen in 1911. His trek took him 17 months. For Clipper New Horizons, it's been a swift seven hour, 10 minute flight from Cape Town. Five seconds, four, three, two, one. Ladies and gentlemen, you're at the South Pole. Congratulations, ladies and gentlemen. This is Captain Mulligan now, and a toast to all of you for the big moment we've been waiting for. Congratulations, and congratulations for being aboard. Someday, maybe, other travelers will fly over both poles on their way around the world. But these Flight 50 passengers can always say, we did it first. It's raining hard when Flight 50 arrives in Auckland, but the music of the Maori instruments and singers extends a warm welcome. The Maoris are New Zealand Aborigines. Once a fierce and warlike tribe, they are now civilized members of the community. This dance is a traditional greeting. Pacific is a part of the world Pan Am knows well. In 1935, Pan Am's China Clipper made the first scheduled flight across the Pacific. Four years later, Pan Am's Yankee Clipper inaugurated the first transatlantic service. And of course, Pan Am was the first American airline to fly jet aircraft, and the first airline in the world to fly the 747 and 747 SP. And now, Pan Am is about to chalk up still another first. The route for the final leg will be all over water. It will pass west of Tahiti, then cross the vast Central Pacific, fly east of the Hawaiian Islands, and finally land at San Francisco, completing its circle of the globe. On the way, we interviewed the youngest and oldest passengers aboard. My name is Sharon Walter, and I'm 11 years old. And the reason I came on the flight is because my mom and dad are pilots, and you know, I've sort of worked myself into flying, and I like it. And I, I like Pan Am. And I just thought it would be fun to set the record around the world. My name is John Janice. I am 82 years old and uh, came on this trip because I'm interested in uh, all new developments and new uh, kinds of trips because I travel as much as uh, 30 to 40,000 miles per year. Would you do it again? Yes, I believe I would. I, uh, I, I, think, I think really I would because I also enjoyed the company. There were lots and lots and lots of uh, very interesting people in, uh, on the ship here. Including a very special guest on the flight, Harry Byrd, grandson of the legendary polar explorer, Admiral Richard Byrd. He is presented with an American flag that has now been carried over both poles on Flight 50. We asked him how it felt to look down on the places his famous grandfather once explored. Well, it's quite an experience, and it really is a, a thrill to, well, be able to say I did the same thing my grandfather did, although not quite in the same way, but it is exciting. As if in a hurry to get home, Clipper New Horizons makes its best time on the final stretch averaging 569 miles an hour. As the sun sets, the California coastline is almost in sight. And as darkness falls, Clipper New Horizons makes its approach into San Francisco's International Airport and touches down. Its long journey is over. The time is 6.57 p.m., exactly 54 hours and seven minutes after it took off from here. It has slashed nearly eight hours off the previous record. 
Captain Mulligan talks about the trip. The entire trip was a complete thrill to me. Of course, I think our passengers had so much to do with that. The passengers were all energetic, all enthusiastic, and all obviously aviation buffs. I'm fortunate enough to have been selected to fly this particular flight, and I believe, honestly, that people like challenges. They enjoy going on something different, and I enjoy being part of it. I loved it. And the passengers, how do they feel about it? Great airlines. The crews were terrific. They couldn't have been better. Well, just a great experience, and certainly enjoyed it. It was just like one long two-day party. Oh, it was fantastic. We really had a good time. Everybody was nice, and I'll do her again. I'm going to be with the again. <laughs> I need a bed and a bath right now. I'm going to go take a shower, about an hour and a half shower. I'll brush my teeth and everything else, but I had a great time. Just wonderful. I'd like to do it again. Fabulous. Every second of it. <laughs> it was just out of this world. One of the greatest experiences in my life. I'm seeing the South Pole this morning. Here we are in San Francisco tonight. It was fantastic. Super, super. I thought it was a terrific adventure. It was terribly, terribly exciting. It was a lifetime dream for me to come true. To circle the world, to go all the way around it, more than four centuries after Magellan, it's still the ultimate trip on this earth of ours. <laughs>